So it's a sea level rise viewer tool specifically for American Samoa. Um, there are a couple of other viewer tools out there, but those are more of a national scale. So ours is specific to the situation for us here in the islands. And I'm really excited to have today with me Carla Baizu, who is here from University of Hawaii, and she's been spending the last year and a half of her life crunching data for us to create this viewer. Um, so all technical questions go to Carla. <laughs> and this will be a recorded talk. Um, and any questions you guys have, we're really excited to hear them. And if you want to communicate with the two folks who are gonna be with us on Zoom, just come up here to ask your questions. So we're gonna have a bunch of time after a couple of brief presentations for discussion, question and answer, so you guys can understand how to use the tool. Um, so to kick us off, um, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Phil Thompson, who's here with us virtually from University of Hawaii, where he serves as the director for the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center. And Phil and I went to grad school together back in Florida, so I'm really glad to have him so that we could have him here today. So Phil, if you wanna come on and share a few words with folks um, about the project and your role in it. Thanks. Sure, uh, thanks Kelly, you were, you were muted there so I don't know what you said about me, so, uh, I believe it's good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so, hello uh, uh, everyone. Um, I'm, I don't know what Kelly said yet, but I'm a, an associate professor at UH Manoa. Um, I'm in the oceanography department. Uh, I'm also the director of the UH Sea Level Center. And in our group, we are uh, concerned with uh, measuring, understanding, and uh, changes in sea level and connecting those changes to communities. Uh, actually, my, my group, we just, um, with Kelly's help, we just installed four new tide gauges in uh, American Samoa. Um, one there at Awasi, uh, one in Anu, uh, one in Ofu, and one in Tahu. And so we're really hoping uh, that that data can uh, help chart a path forward there in coming decades in response to sea level rise. And I um, appreciate uh, your communities there actually in inviting us into, in, into your communities to, to do that work. So that's really great. Um, so now I guess uh, with the sea level rise viewer that we're going to talk about here, um, uh, I guess on paper I'm responsible for it, but in reality uh, I can take very little credit for what you're going to see. Um, I should first acknowledge uh, PyCAS. Uh, that's the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, they provided the funding for this tool. Um, and what's great about PyCast is uh, they not only invest with their dollars, but they also invest their time and energy, and they do a great job of facilitating uh, conversations between scientists and practitioners and communities really all over the Pacific, and so we're lucky to be working with them. Um, uh, of course, uh, Kelly has been uh, absolutely fundamental and instrumental to this project. Uh, um, she really understands the gaps in the information. I think it's really the most important thing, right? She understands the gaps and has been working with us to help fill them. And understanding the needs of the community there, it's, 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 uh, it's really incredible to have her involved. Um, and then Carla, uh, who you're going to meet in just a moment, um, uh, she's really the one who's put in the technical effort here uh, and sometimes doing the, the tedious and difficult work of putting all these pieces together. Uh, and I'm really excited for her to not only be able to present this to you, but also to understand, you know, what a really truly important contribution it is. And I think that's uh, amazing. And lastly, I just want to point out um, uh, PACAYUS, uh, the Pacific uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System. Uh, they are, uh, and John Maurer in particular, uh, they are the ones who actually built the website. And so they put the information that Carla produced onto the web and in a digestible and easily viewable format for everyone. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we're just really excited to be able to present this, and uh, thank you again for welcoming us into your community there and working with us, and we hope that what we've done here is useful. Um, it can be a useful resource for many years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, so, briefly, just so folks who I don't know know a little bit about my story. I came down here in 2009 to do some coral bleaching research and I started doing a few other contracts here um, with marine wildlife and sanctuaries and then I landed at the college serving as their marine science program director. In 2013 I switched over to working for University of Hawaii but still based full-time here at the college 
as the American Samoa Sea Grant Extension Agent. And in that position, I also took on the role of our Pacific Island Ocean Observing System that Phil mentioned, who's hosting this tool. Um, and I maintained a sensor that lived off the seawall behind Fongatongo Market. And when I started looking at that data more closely and our tide gauge data more closely in 2013, I realized that there was a very sharp trend in the data showing a very rapid increase in our sea level at the very same date of the tsunami in 2009. And so that's what made me start asking questions about this topic. And so now, almost a full decade later, I'm really excited to be able to bring us a tool to help um, people plan for their future. And to help us do that, Carla and I were going to share a bit of background of context for this. So for those who don't know, American Samoa has had the highest rate of sea level rise anywhere in America for quite a while now. And uh, that means that we should be provided quite a bit of services to adapt to that. Um, and so I always want to mention that up front because I think it's an important way of framing the issue in our heads. So, um, unfortunately, not only was that 2009 tsunami incredibly devastating to our community in terms of loss of life and property, um, it also left this lasting legacy of our island sinking, what we call subsidence, the land moving down. So it took a, a bit of time to figure out that that was in fact what was causing it. Um, myself and others from here, including Eleanor at the Weather Service, we started asking questions to NOAA tides because that was the only instrument that we knew of, the tide gauge that lived behind Fangatongo Market. And that tide gauge showed us some pretty clear information. So, I know the slides are a bit washed out because of all the light in here, um, but again, it is recorded and I'm happy to share any of this with anybody who reaches out. But hopefully you can see that vertical black line over there. That is the date of the tsunami. And you can see that the blue line after that on this side went up quite a bit. So that happened because our tide gauge is attached to our seawall. I think most people know the seawall behind the Fangatongo Market. Um, there used to be a tree there before it died from sea level rise that kids would always jump off of, right? So it was right back over there behind the Marine Wildlife Department, and it was on the wall. And so as the island was sinking, it's recording this higher and higher amount of water above it, yeah? And so that's why you see this trend going up so much. We call that relative sea level rise because it's including the amount that our land is sinking adding on to what we think of as global sea level rise from climate change. This is information from one other instrument. The orange line is from here at our ASPA compound in Tafuna. Um, so back into the compound where the flagpoles are, there's this funny pole that looks like candy cane striping, white and red. That is this instrument. It's called a core station and it's a continuously operating recording station. That's what it stands for. And it measures our elevation. So on the y-axis, those numbers, ignore them. Arbitrary. What's important is the average movement from that starting point. So if you look at that orange line, up until that red letters of the 2009 earthquake, it's fairly flat. That's our normal rate of subsidence in the background, about a millimeter or two a year maybe. But then the earthquake happened that caused the tsunami and that shifted the way we sit on our plate, our tectonic plate. Unfortunately, it shifted us in a way that we're now sinking. So you can see that pretty clear trend going down, right, in orange. The blue line above it, that's from the same type of instrument, but in Apia near the um, Apia Airport, not Faliolo. So both of these show that we are both sinking. However, it also shows, you can tell that the orange line was dropping faster than the blue line. And so we know that there's a difference in the rate that 
Tutuila is sinking versus Upolu. Another way of framing this sea level in our minds is American Samoa saw more sea level rise in the decade after the tsunami than in the previous century. So we are truly one of those frontline communities when we're facing and talking about sea level rise. And a lot of that is driven by the sinking, not so much the oceans going up for us. So it's important to think about that because we are a different case when you're thinking about sea level rise in other places. Um, and so that little image down there where those two lines cross, the orange is from our CORS data. So our elevation, you can see it went down when the tsunami happened. The blue is our tide gauge showing our sea level. And so where they cross on that dotted line, that was driven by the earthquakes that caused the tsunami. So another big question for us is our reefs. We all know that our reefs are where our waves break, anywhere we have a fringing reef. And this beautiful photo that was taken by Valentine Bayoso um, shows that really clearly that we have this really great protective source of a fringing reef. But the question is, are they able, is that reef crest able to keep up with this rapid sea level rise? Right? We've increased our sea level rise and condensed 100 years of sea level rise into 10. So far, it looks like they're keeping up, which is amazing. But we want to see if that's going to stay into the future or not. Um, so I've worked with some of our partners here on the ground and federal funding sources to get us some money to start tracking that. And I think we might be one of the first South Pacific Islands to start trying to answer that question. Because every island that has a fringing reef has the same question. How long will those reefs keep breaking the waves for us? Because we know that when we have bigger waves, they increase the amount of land we're losing, right? Um, the image is right from the Matafau Elementary shoreline, which is not very sandy anymore, uh, we all know. Um, the photo on the left is from everybody's favorite history Facebook chat on American Samoa through the years from about 1967. And the photo on the right is one that I took in 2014. This isn't new to anybody who's lived here. We've all seen this evolution of our shorelines. Um, and it's just intensified since the tsunami. Um, this, this situation of coastal flooding has also intensified. And unfortunately, you cannot seawall out the ocean. It comes up through the ground, through our rock layer. Um, Seawalls can help you reduce the wave erosion, but they're not gonna wall out the water. So that's the background and the context of why we needed a viewer that was specific to American Samoa. And now Carla's gonna share what she's learned in her master's work in creating this tool for us. Hi, hi everyone, so I'm Carla. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the science background and how we built this viewer. Um, I wanted to, to only talk about two data sets so to not make it too complicated and so we can actually have time to look at the viewer itself because this is what we want to do. Uh, so here on the slide you can see two different data sets. The first one is the digital elevation model, which is basically the elevation of each island in American Samoa, except Swain's Atoll. So this DEM was built and produced in 2012, so quite a long time ago, and we are expecting to have a new one coming either by the end of 2023 or in 2024, <laughs> soon relatively. Um, and so the other data sets are the sea level projections. Um, those projections range from low to high, and those are separated depending on scenarios, on greenhouse gases emissions, um, and so how much heat is going to be added to the atmosphere, and this is translated into sea level rise. Um, the important point about those projections is that we added land subsidence specific to American Samoa, 
uh, it was done by um, a study in 2019 by Hahn and colleagues, and so they have very specific lens subsidence projection for here. So we added those in those projections. Um, so combining those two data sets, um, we made a passive flooding model. A passive flooding model, often called a bathtub model, simulates sea level rise by, ra by raising uniformly the water level. So we don't take into account, thanks Kelly, we don't really take into account any dynamics of the ocean. So any waves are not taken into account. So usually it underestimates the amount of sea level that we see um, uh, on those maps that we're gonna show you soon. Um, however, this, this diagram is, I think, the, it was for me pretty useful to understand water flooding, which is basically when the, um, aquifer or the groundwater inside the rock is close to the shore, close to the surface, as sea level increases it's going to raise this water table and so you're going to also see groundwater flooding even though those areas are not connected to the shoreline. So that's why sometimes on those maps you're going to see flooding, flooded areas that are not connected to the shore. Um, Yes, yeah, so that was a quick introduction to what I did. And then this is what we're gonna show you on the Sea Level Rise Viewer. I think in between Stacy is gonna talk, so we're gonna show you this after. But just as a preemptive discussion, you're gonna see different scenarios, the same one as I showed you on the projections, ranging from low to high. And so this would be one slider. Another slider is gonna depend on time, and you're gonna have the associated uh, water level with that and then you have there's another slider um, which is looking at flooding um, so the the, uh, the number of days that oh my god that this is going to respond to sorry sometimes I get a little stressed I guess um, so you're going to have for example a 50 day event is going to be higher and it's going to be it's going to show you more flooding and then you're going to have a one day event per year this is going to show you even more flooding and those are useful for planning purposes in the future and then this is my contact and thank you don't worry carla's not leaving um but we do <laughs> have another speaker so i mentioned that this subsidence is really the important part of what's causing this rapid sea level rise here for American Samoa and Samoa. Um, and Carla found that about seven of the nine inches of sea level rise we've seen since 2009 are from us sinking. And so it is really important to understand that information. And we are really lucky that NASA, you know, the space com or the space um, version government agency that does space work used their tools to study our subsidence. Um, and so, Stacy Huang was the postdoc, I hope I'm getting this right, Stacy, um, to Jean Sauber Rosenberg, who was one of the authors on the paper that Carla mentioned where we got our subsidence information from. And she's continuing her work in American Samoa and Samoa on subsidence. So Stacy's gonna share some information with you guys. And if you have questions on it, please do feel free to just jump up and ask before you forget your question. Okay, uh, so I'll quickly just um, uh, try to explain some of the work that we've done. Um, hello, hi everyone, uh, and thank you so much, Kelly, for inviting me to speak. Uh, today, um, very very honored to be able to explain a little bit about what uh, we've been able to do the past uh, couple years. As Kelly mentioned, I uh, the past couple years I was serving as a postdoc with uh, Gene Sauber at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I'm currently actually uh, continuing as a research scientist at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, and. Uh, I'm going to present to you today about the work that we've done to uh, kind of expand upon the work that Carla mentioned briefly about substance from the uh, Han et al. paper. Um, and in particular, we're trying to better identify some local patterns of substance in American Samoa. Um, and it's really much, really thinking about the sinking land part. Um, so as, as, as uh, Kelly mentioned, let's see. Um, 
We know that earthquakes have unfortunately also long-term effects in addition to the immediate destructive consequences. And of course the big earthquake that we're thinking of is the 2009 earthquake. Started with shaking, uh, then had the big tsunami as well. Um, but unfortunately there's also the long-term effects of continuing sinking of the land causing a lot of flooding and this is um, a, a very poignant picture that Kelly shared with us of you know, increasing nuisance flooding and the ground is just continuing to sink and sink. Um, so of course, uh, from a scientist's perspective, what we can do to try and help is to better measure and forecast these long-term changes. Um, and so I'll be showing a couple of figures from the Han et al. paper where he uh, and the team first measured um, and, and showed some of these long-term changes. Um, from a scientific perspective, what we could do, of course, is to first make some measurements and see what the Earth is doing. Um, then we can create a model to compare those measurements with, and we can keep refining our model until we are happy that it reproduces most of what we see in the measurements, and then we can translate that into a prediction of future behavior, um, including trying to model how much the land is going to keep subsiding and how that will affect flooding over time. Here I'm going to be zooming in on um, an extension of this work where we are making some new measurements, um, in particular um, with a little bit of a higher resolution over American Samoa. Um, and the reason that this is important is that while the Han paper showed that substance is a very clear uh, stress stressor um, and increases a lot of climate pressure in American Samoa, uh, he actually only represented the uh, entire set of islands with two data points. Um, and so this is why in this coastal resilience assessment report, they say that there are insufficient spatial data across the study area to include substance actually when considering coastal resilience measures. Um, and uh, Xinjiang Han and his team actually were using the tide gauge and the, the GPS cores uh, measurements that Kelly mentioned. Um, and so we're trying to come in and expand upon that, see if we can um, see something a little bit more clear about what's going on. And the key questions that we are trying to answer are first, of course, um, how much is the land sinking relative to the sea rising? Are there areas that are sinking faster? And where are they if so? And of course, we want an updated estimate of how long the land will keep sinking and where. Um, so this slide pretty much recaps the uh, measurement sources that we were using. Uh, we use different types of remote sensing data, which means that we are drawing data from satellites either talking to sensors on the ground or uh, satellites that are imaging uh, the Earth directly. Um, and so as Kelly mentioned, there's the uh, Pango Pango type gauge station out here, uh, as well as the ASPA GPS station. Uh, so we're continuing to use those two data sources as uh, Kelly already showed. Um, in addition to that, we are adding one additional data source, which is a radar satellite. Uh, the, the data type is called Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, or INSAR. Uh, in this case, we're drawing uh, some, our data from a very nice public data set from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 satellite. Uh, the unfortunate part is that that satellite only actually images um, Tutuila as well as Onu'u, but uh, doesn't actually extend farther out to the east but we'll be showing the data that we were able to process in this area. So when we take a look again at the tide gauge uh, and the GPS data, we can get an initial look at what's going on uh, around the island. Um, the top here shows a raw trace where how we are uh, basically extracting that um, vertical land motion, the land sinking part where we subtract, this is uh, some satellite data measuring the sea surface height, and then the, uh, the tide gauge um, is, uh, is measuring the, the, the relative tides. Uh, basically, when we subtract those two, we get this nice trend, or maybe not so nice, but we, we get a very clear trend, shall we say. Um, again, we can really see once the earthquake struck in 2009, there's this big drop in the land, um, and 
started to sink um, a lot more quickly than before. Um, it's actually sunk about 18 centimeters or about seven inches since 2009, um, as, as has already been mentioned. And we can also compare that to the sinking of the GPS station. And when we plot that on the same uh, plot, we can see a similar trend. We see the big drop from the earthquake. But interestingly, if we fit a linear line to each of those uh, data as well, we see that there's a little bit of a difference in the rate of subsidence uh, between those two, which suggests that there is evidence of local differences in the amount of sinking around Tutuila. Um, could be, uh, there are earthquake uh, components to that, um, in addition to perhaps some local differences such as groundwater extraction. And so that's where we can come in with uh, radar data um, to better uh, break down those, those finer details. Um, so essentially, radar data is actually a little bit difficult to use in this area. There, it doesn't work that well um, in, in areas that, are, uh, that have a lot of thick vegetation and cloud cover. And so we actually uh, designed a new technique that made it so that we were, would be able to use our radar data uh, over this area while also maintaining the reliability of our results. Um, so I'll just show you what we were able to find. Um, these, these black and white areas are where we weren't able to get any data. But you can see that it's not just two points. We don't have many points, um, a few hundred, in fact, um, around the island. And I've blown up here um, some of the, uh, the, the denser areas for uh, Hopefully it's, this is a little bit easier to see, but I know the lighting in the room might not make it too easy. But what we're actually seeing here is that even though the tide gate station suggested maybe uh, the Pango Pango area might have been subsiding a little bit less quickly than the uh, airport area, we see on average actually that there are more oranges and reds um, around the harbor compared to around the airport. Um, likely due to the fact that this is uh, right along the coastline. Um, and we see that the substance rate ranges from about six to nine millimeters a year in the past uh, six, seven years or so, and that's about 0.2 to 0.4 inches a year. Um, so we're really excited that we were able to show an unprecedented view of the spatial trends and sinking around um, the coastlines. Um, and we were actually seeing that not only there was high, higher average deformation in the Pango Pango area, but also on Aonu'u. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of red here showing that there's actually quite a bit of um, substance in that area. So recapping to our initial three questions, um, we we're actually able to answer a little bit more measurements that uh, showed higher, much higher uh, detail, much higher detail in Tutuila than we have been able to see before. Um, the next steps, as I mentioned, are to integrate that with our current model and to update our predictions of future behavior. And just as a corollary to, or just kind of like a sidebar <laughs> to these measurements is that we're actually seeing that there are some local differences that might not entirely have to do with the earthquake-related signals and maybe um, having to do, like I mentioned, with uh, groundwater pumping and we need to 
definitely further investigate this as well. Um, I will also mention that the work that we have been doing is part of a broader study um, led by James Hopper uh, to investigate coastal land change um, from the 2009 earthquake and hazards for um, the Samoan Islands, Samoan Islands generally. Um, this is including a broader team of scientists and remote sensing tools, um, and we're trying to track uh, landscape change as well as subsidence um, more broadly. And so um, you can see that we're using a, a, a bit more satellite data as well. Unfortunately, still doesn't, <laughs> it only covers uh, Tutuila and Onu'u, but we have some pretty good coverage over the independent nation of Samoa as well. So um, we're currently working on uh, that as well. Uh, so general takeaways uh, of the presentation today, um, we've been able to characterize uh, substance on Tutuila at a higher resolution than ever before. Uh, we have published this in a peer-reviewed paper, which uh, is very technical, so I think um, uh, I'm glad that I'm able to, to present to you in a little bit more of an accessible way today. Um, but the important thing is that our results do fill a data gap identified by the American Samoa Five-Year Hazard Mitigation Plan uh, released in 2020, as well as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 2022, and hopefully can be integrated um, as part of developing coastal resilience strategies. And step one is uh, we're glad that we're able to include that as an extra uh, map in uh, Carla's sea level viewer. Um, so our continuing work, as I mentioned, is studying changes in substance rates, um, increasing the study area to include the independent nation of Samoa as well, um, and trying to integrate that into future predictive uh, trends. And also, we want to better understand some of these local substance trends that we uh, see popping out in our data as well. Um, so I thank you very much for your attention. That's all I have to say, uh, but I'm also happy to take any questions. Any questions on our sinking rates for, for Stacy? No, you did a fabulous job, Stacy. There's no questions. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear. Thank you so much. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of the fact that we are sinking. The rate is not the same across Tutuila, and it seems to be faster in the Pongo Pongo area and Aonu'u area. Um, and it looked like from Stacy's work in her paper as well that the north side of Tutuila is not sinking as fast as the south side. Um, but they are continuing that work, and the good news is that we are sinking less than we were, but it'd still be great if we just weren't sinking so much at all. Um, but we will be keeping in touch with Stacy's work so that we can improve what goes into our viewer, which is what we're going to be looking at. Um, So, Manua, um, they are included in our viewer. Everything but Swains at the moment is because Swains was not part of the 2012 LIDAR flight, so they're not in this DEM. Um, but we don't have any gauges, or didn't have any gauges in Manua before. So, if anybody saw the small plane buzzing the villages um, November to December timeframe last year, that was the LIDAR plane. Um, and so they were taking laser measurements of the land and the water um, to get really accurate elevation. But what I learned, you don't get elevation from LIDAR alone. You have to rely on what we call ground control points, which is your tide gauge or a core station. Those didn't exist in Aonu'u or Manua. Um, but as Phil mentioned at the beginning, we were able to install gauges in Aonu'u and Awasi so that we have an east side of Tutuila ground control point and then Ta'u and Ofu. Um, there was no wharf in Olasenga, so we couldn't put one there, but we're gonna assume it'll be about equal rates for Olasenga and Ofu. Um, so once we get data from those gauges coming in, maybe in the next year or two, we can make better updates for the projections in those islands. Um, but for now, this is what'll come up on the landing site of the viewer. You can just Google American Samoa Sea Level Rise Viewer 
you switch over to your full screen, this is what you'll see. Um, your control buttons are for zooming in and out are up here. And as you zoom in, once you get close enough, it'll automatically switch over to a Google Earth kind of interface. So right now, what you see is colors showing the amount of flooding we expect in the year 2100. So these are the sliders that Carla mentioned that she was able to provide the 800 some odd layers to support us having the ability of making these changes to help us plan better. Thank you, Carla. Um, that wasn't an easy task. Um, so you can adjust the slider to what year you want to look at. You can also adjust, as Carla mentioned, the scenario slider. And there's some descriptive text in here explaining those scenarios, but essentially high scenario is high amounts of sea level rise because of high amounts of greenhouse gases. And yes, our subsidence is also in here, and it's not like a one subsidence rate into the future. We are using the changes projected from the information collected. So it is a decreasing rate of subsidence into the future, but an increasing rate of sea level rise because of climate change. Um, so this is how to drive it, zooming in and out. And for me, if I wanna see my house, I can't see it. It's under all these colors. Um, so you can tone that down with this nice opacity slider so that you can see through things better. And another nice feature that, again, Carla was kind enough to support with all of her work, you can click on any part where you see those colors and get what we call point-click data, which means it'll give you what is estimated for that exact pixel that you clicked on. So if you want to plan for auntie, uncle, grandma's house, you can click on their exact house and get the expected amount of water at high tide in the year you have it set to. But again, as Carla mentioned, this is only a passive flooding model, which means there's no waves in it yet. Um, but I am glad to say I was able to work with local partners to get funding. And so we will be putting out wave gauges in the coming years to collect that information. And that information combined with the information from that LIDAR plane, which gave us our very first information on how deep our shallow waters are down our reef slope, that's what's really needed for us to get accurate forecasts for how much wave inundation or flooding there will be in the future. Those of us who were on island in July last year on that swell storm, that was, I think, a real wake-up call of hey, that was really big waves, and hopefully we don't see those again for a very long time. But they also hit us at a very high tide of our king tide. Um, and so we wanna be able to share information with people so that they can plan on what they wanna do, their land and their infrastructure. Um, so you can look anywhere in the territory except for Swains. Um, you can use this one to jump over to specific islands instead of having to pan around. Um, and again, you can zoom in and adjust the sliders to see better or change your time frame and what you want to look at. And down here is the slider Carla mentioned, um, which is another unique feature for this viewer where it gives you these um, flood days per year. So I'll let Carla fill in the details, but one flood day per year is gonna be the most severe type of flooding. The lower it is, the less severe that flooding is because a once a year flood is more severe than a 50 times a year flood. Is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you can also type in places like say Ofu Airport, so you don't, we don't have physical addresses, of course, but you can type in place names or villages and it'll take you straight to them um, so that you can look around in those areas. And all of the data from here is available. You can download it, you can use it, and it's free there for the public. I know, I'm sorry, Rain. I should, your mom knows about this, though. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the easiest thing to see, I agree. Um, and the other thing I want to point out that ties into what Carla mentioned about the groundwater flooding. So we all know that water comes up through the ground and that our fresh water sits on top of our salt water. So that salt water coming up is pushing our fresh water up. And that's why all this red is here and that's how Fusi. So anywhere you have a wetland, it's low lying, it's got water in it, that salt water is pushing that fresh water up. And that's where you're gonna see some of the highest levels of flooding that aren't attached to the coastline. So, any other words I missed in the viewer, Carla? Oh, I don't think so. Good job. Right. Great job. So, questions, yes. address the seawall question a bit. Um, so seawalls do have some consequences for our shorelines. So places where you might have seen a seawall built, if it's not around the whole shoreline, what do you see where the end of it is? Erosion, right? So waves naturally lose their energy on a gradual slope of a shoreline. When you take that away and create a wall or even the slanted rock ones like in Fanganeanea and Matu'u, you're still increasing the amount of energy that gets reflected off that wall. Um, but obviously we don't have space in a lot of our areas in the island. So seawalls are a necessity in some places. Unfortunately, you can't wall out the water. So it can help you reduce the erosion from the waves, but you're not gonna keep the water from coming up through the land. Yeah. Um, and so we are looking at some other options in places where they work like nature-based solutions is the hot buzzword. Um, basically using what we have already, local rocks, plants that can live on the coast, native coastal plants, so working with our land-grant forestry division to try and use what we can to protect our shores in places where that's a solution. So yes, seawalls are part of the answer for sure. And then I think, Stacy, the other question is better suited for you. Um, the question was, Will smaller, smaller earthquakes like what we've had throughout this year and maybe as an example, the seismic swarm in Ta'u last year, would those cause changes to our subsidence rate? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think that's something that, you know, as scientists, we're also the, <laughs> I guess the unsatisfying answer is we don't really know. It seems like every earthquake is special, basically, right? And that's part of why it's really important for us to do these local studies. I think as, as a general matter, we do think that the biggest and most sort of like the ones that we need to worry about the most are the larger earthquakes because they do basically, as Kelly was saying, right, cause these shifts in how you're placed on the tectonic plate, essentially. So um, I guess <laughs> the answer is generally, I think the ones we need to worry about are the big earthquakes, but I can't always say like, yes, that will always be the case, but uh, hopefully that is the case. Okay, so I'll just summarize because I know the, the zoom to mic is a little bit challenging. Um, each earthquake is special, so it's possible, but it's generally the biggest quakes that would have the most impact on subsidence. And I'll also add that because of that seismic swarm in Ta'u last year, um, Hawaii volcanoes came down here and put in some of these GPS stations to record our elevation, as well as instruments called seismometers that measure the quake. So we should be able to get really good information from the Ta'u example and answer your very question. Yeah. Other Thank questions? You, Other areas you want to see in the viewer while it's here on the big screen? <laughs> Well, 
Yeah, the college is going to be safe for a long time. <laughs> Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for spending some time with us today. And again, you can find this tool online. Um, it is hosted by PACAUSE, but you can find it just by Googling American Samoa Sea Level Rise Viewer. And we give our thanks to PyCast for funding it. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. My office is just back there at the end of the road. and. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'll send him to Carla. <laughs> so, Papatai Teli Lava for spending time with us today. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Thanks so much.